welcome to day two of the Democratic National Convention here in Philadelphia. Tonight's headliner, the king of convention speeches, speech, speakers, former President Bill Clinton. But first, the nomination roll call vote is about to start on the House floor just beneath us. This is, of course, an historic moment for Hillary Clinton and for the nation as she shifts from presumptive to officially the first woman ever to be the presidential nominee of a major political party in the United States. In another effort to tamp down the discord among anti-Clinton forces here, there are some reports now that Bernie Sanders' home state of Vermont may put Clinton over the top with the majority of delegates by shifting the order of the states. At a Bloomberg Politics Breakfast hosted by Al Hunt this morning, here's how Sanders himself answered questions about why, despite his endorsement of Clinton, he's still encouraging delegates to vote for him this evening. Why would I do that? I mean, there's, a, there's an election. And we were said, we're going to lose. But why would you, if you were campaigning for me for six months or eight months and knocking your brains out, and then the roll call came, who are you going to vote for? Who do you think you're going to vote for? You're going to vote for Bernie Sanders. That's what I would do. Why would you not do that? Why would you say to people who works, you lose? I lost. Everybody in this room was lost. You cast your vote. The other side gets more votes. You accept that and you go on. And hopefully you support the winner. A lot of Sanders delegates told us last night that they're waiting until after the roll call this evening to lay down arms because they resented the convention speakers treating Clinton Monday like she was already the nominee. So, John, if all goes as planned, we don't know exactly how it's going to play out. But if this nomination uh, happens and, and Clinton is nominated, does this represent a turning of the page for the unhappy Sanders delegates and represent the party unity they'd like to have by the end of the evening? I think it will represent a turning of the page for sure. And represent is a key word. And I think, you know, to the extent this is a big giant television program, I think it will look like party unity. In fact, last night, by the time Sanders spoke, by the time the booze had all subsided around Michelle Obama, things had calmed down a lot. You know, there's still a lot of Sanders people out in the streets here in Philadelphia who are never going to be for Hillary Clinton. I don't know if that will be a numerically important number, a numerically significant number by the time we get to November, but, you know, there's still a lot of grumpy Sanders voters around here, but I think in terms of the optics of it, I think they will probably get there with the way they've staged this and engineered it. He was heckled again today. Some Clinton folks who appeared before delegation meetings were heckled. We overstated last night the chances that this would dominate the convention, maybe the whole convention. As Jeff Weaver pointed out to yeah. us later that night. Uh, but I'm not ready to go all the other all the other direction. I still have the sense that there's going to be a last gasp here that will represent at least a, a discordant note. But in the end, between Bernie Sanders, who may still play some sort of role in the nominating process, uh, he said this morning he wouldn't be surprised if she got, uh, after a certain amount of votes were tallied, if she got nominated by acclamation. And if he adds his voice to that and the room is largely pro Clinton, which I think it will be because of the historic right. moment, I think they will have turned the page on this. And yesterday, yesterday morning and midday and early afternoon, discord will be a distant memory. One of the things about conventions is that you never really know what's going on on some level, right? Yeah. We all report like crazy, but, you know, we've Hard heard to imagine you got... 40,000 reporters in this building, and well, there's still a lot of uncertainty. But seriously, there's a lot, you know, there's an element, they want to have an element of surprise in how this goes. We've now had it reported that the Vermont delegation will be the one that, they're basically all Sanders delegates, and they're going to want to push, him, push Hillary Clinton over the top at Sanders' instruction. But there was reporting all day on, would he put his, would he put her name into nomination? There's reporting from the floor that says that the Vermont delegation knows nothing about this plan. You know, I don't know what's going to actually play out tonight. Bernie and Jane Sanders are in the hall, and as uh, the nominating process gets underway here, every time Bernie Sanders' name is mentioned, there's roars. Roars. Now, yeah. that's, that was the pattern yesterday. Yep. His people are loud. Let's see, again, what the dynamic here is uncertain, but it does seem like it's headed towards eventually reconciliation and unity, which is what the Clinton folks want. All right. Um, let's move on to another topic here, maybe even a bigger topic. That's Bill Clinton. He will have his turn in the spotlight when he takes the stage tonight. Jeff's after 10 p.m. Eastern time. This will be the Big Dog's 10th, count them 10, consecutive convention addresses, but his first as the spouse of a nominee. This morning at another Bloomberg Politics Breakfast, Clinton campaign chairman John Podesta offered a little insight into how WJC is preparing for his star turn on behalf of HRC. This is different. This is more personal. This is more about her. And uh, he wrote the draft himself, and then he, he's, you know, working with uh, some of the people he likes to work with to try to polish it up. Um, 
shorten it up, my guess is. <laughs> Bill Clinton doesn't like to leave it in the locker room. <laughs> you know, he, he has a lot to say. Let's put it that way. He has a lot to say, and I'm sure he'll say it eloquently. So Bill Clinton has maintained a fairly low profile by his standards during this campaign so far. But Mark, my question for you is whether you think tonight he is going to, as he has so many times in the past, bring his A game, or is there a chance that given how little he's played a role so far in the campaign, he might be a little rusty? If he were a normal person, uh, he might be rusty because he's not given a speech like this in a while, but he just has a history of on big, big nights, not always on big nights, but on big, big nights of shaking off the rust automatically and the crowd will love him. Yeah. And that is for him the thing that he feeds off of. So I suspect he'll have a well written speech. I suspect he's still working on it at this hour. Yeah. And I suspect the crowd will carry him to a place where people remember, as I've said since I started covering him in 1991, he's the best that ever was. He is, um, you know, people remember back these same questions, even more so in 2012, 2008, kind of hovered around him. Was he rusty? Had he lost his fastball? He got up in 2012 and said, I still got like a Tom Seaver heater, you know? And he was incredible and overshadowed everybody, including Barack Obama, just four years ago. He has not been even more off the stage this time than he was that time. But I, to me, I think he'll do very well. The question is, they've got him slotted for only a half an hour tonight. Ridiculous. Only a half an hour. Ridiculous. Maybe the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen we'll in the convention be here, We'll be here until midnight, or they'll have yeah. to throw, there's some program after him that they'll have to yeah. get rid of. I think there's one danger for him. The one danger for him is he knows that last night Bernie Sanders spoke and Michelle Obama got his, his, his speech was called historically good. He knows tomorrow. Uh, Joe Biden and Barack Obama are speaking competition. Yeah, I think he may ad lib, ad lib, ad lib, and go and go and go until he's convinced that his will be considered the best. best yes. And that may lead him ironically to a place where it's not as good as it could be. Yeah, it's possible. You know, he's got, he really does have a, it's, it, I, I'm going to go back to 12 again just to make this one point. It, you know, he was really important. Not only was the speech great last time, he had to validate Barack Obama in a really important way. He has a different kind of validation to do now with Hillary Clinton. And in some ways, Barack Obama for Hillary Clinton is playing the role that Bill Clinton played for Barack Obama last time. So there's just a lot of interesting psycho and psychodynamics played out on stage over the next 48 hours. Yeah. All right, last week when the Republicans were meeting in Cleveland, Hillary Clinton broke with tradition and campaigned hard throughout the week. This week, Republicans are counter uh, 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 programming just as hard as Clinton did. The ticket of Trump and uh, Pence and the RNC are doing all sorts of things. The RNC is having press conferences every day here in, in Philadelphia. Uh, Donald Trump and Mike Pence campaigned together in Virginia and North Carolina yesterday, and they held a VFW event this morning in Charlotte, North Carolina. Trump also spent much of last night tweeting during the Democratic speeches here, taking aim at Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker, and others throughout the evening. Pence did a remote interview with Sean Hannity last night on Fox News Channel. So, John, is this Republican counterprogramming breaking through? No, I don't think it's breaking through at all, and not because it's Republican counterprogramming. I don't think the Democratic counterprogramming broke through last week either. I think, you know, for, for, for the faithful of Donald Trump, they like to hear him jeering from, uh, from the cheap seats, just as Democrats like to hear Democrats jeering Donald Trump from the cheap seats. But the people who love Democrats are watching this and loving it, and the people who are undecided, the people who really matter, they are mostly paying attention, as they were last week to Republicans, they're paying attention to what the Democrats here's, are doing. Here's where I think it's breaking through. They're in battleground states, so they're in places like North Carolina and Florida. And I think in those places, they're going to get even more coverage because the convention's going on, and so politics is part of the lineup of local news stations. And I think sitting, sitting back, going dark as candidates used to do when the opposition party has their convention is a huge mistake because this is all about about seven states probably, and they're in they're in those some of those states this week. So I think it's smart, and, I, and in those local places, I bet it's getting a lot of attention and breaking through. We just uh, heard on the floor that Bernie Sanders has now had his nomination seconded on the floor. That's why you hear the Sanders chanting going on. Um, I, I'll just, you know, I do think, look, I think it's you have to do it if you're the opposing party. But I just think that, relatively speaking, the self-inflicted wounds, because the eyes of the country are on each party when they're holding their conventions, the self-inflicted wounds, if there are any, are much greater than the wounds that the other side can inflict on them, even in those battleground state markets. Yeah. So Bernie Sanders here in the hall, while his name has been seconded and thrown into nomination, this is a part of the evening that's unpredictable. 
none of us can say what's exactly going to happen. But the, the enthusiasm for Sanders, which we did expect, is obvious and palpable in the hall. And the Clinton supporters, I think, are going to be challenged to show just as much energy, just as much noise as Secretary Clinton's nomination is discussed throughout uh, the next several moments throughout this convention. And John, this is uh, a great moment of catharsis for the Sanders sure. folks because they're being treated basically as equals. Right. And they're and they're and they're being treated as equals. It's also a really interesting moment for Bernie Sanders, who was under a lot of pressure last night. The most he was Jane Sanders kind of quietly admitted that he was very nervous yesterday, the biggest speech of his career. Now he gets to sit and kind of revel in this, revel in the adulation of his people. But at the same time, he does not want this to turn into an embarrassment in any way for Hillary Clinton. So he's, I'm sure, down there loving this. At the same time, maybe like a little nervous because he wants this to be just enough for him. But in the end, it's got to be mostly about her and her history making nomination. He wants to be on the right side of history there, I think. Yes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> All right. Um, when we come back, uh, we'll be back with more of that. We'll also tell you what Bernie Sanders is like over breakfast after the biggest speech of his life right after this quick break. Back here in Philadelphia, where Bloomberg Politics and the great Al Hunt hosted not one but two newsmaker breakfasts this morning. The first with Bernie Sanders and the second with Clinton campaign chairman John Podesta. A couple hours after that, Clinton senior strategist Joel Benenson was the featured guest at a Bloomberg lunch co-sponsored with Bruce and Marsteller. We have a ton to talk about related to all three of those uh, interviews and moments. But first, we will show you a little highlights reel. Democracy is a little <laughs> bit messy sometimes especially for young people who worked their hearts out in a campaign, who supported a campaign, and we lost. All right? They worked against Hillary Clinton, and now we're saying, hey, we want you on board to support Hillary Clinton. People have emotions. People have feelings. So I do, you know, I grew up in a family where I got yelled at a whole lot. doesn't get me nervous. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> my campaign will be continuing uh, in the direction of actively bringing people into the political process. Are you going to be raising money for Hillary Clinton? I don't think we'll be raising money for Hillary Clinton, no. Uh, I think we will be raising money for some school board candidate in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who probably does not have the access to money that Hillary Clinton has. Were you a, sort of a fluke, or do you think no. someone else could run on the kind of agenda you ran Absolutely. on and do well? I, you know, I, I, no, no fluke. Uh, I think that what I hope you all appreciate 
is that if there's one thing that I think we showed is that the ideas that we brought forth are not fringe ideas. They are not outside of the mainstream. And it will be a terrible, terrible shame if we do not figure out a way to capture that energy, to capture that idealism, to capture that love of this country. And that's kind of what I want to do. The work now between leaving this convention and November is the nitty gritty work. We'll put it in a context about what a, 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 a Donald Trump presidency would look like and we will take uh, take that argument to him and we will be from the campaign and from her and from uh, Tim we'll see them effectively and aggressively prosecute the case that he should not be president I don't know what he really thinks he's you know he I don't know what he believes all I know is he's He's running, he's running a campaign of racial division, uh, and it's unbecoming of a major national uh, a candidate, whether it's being, you know, saying, Donald, David Duke, who's that? You know, or, uh, you know, the other things that he's done in this campaign. He's <laughs> definitely running on that, uh, 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 a campaign that's intended uh, to stoke up uh, a racial division in in this uh, in this campaign, and and I think he needs when he does it, he should be called out for it. Donald Trump got a small bounce, no bounce, a decent sized bounce. Based on what you've seen, looking at the public data and any data you have, how would you characterize the bounce they got out of Cleveland? Well, the bounce is is only relevant in that it's reinforcing that the election is going to be close. We have three more days to communicate unfiltered. Uh, largely unfiltered, our message to the voters that we're trying to reach through the convention and frame this race on the stakes that we think are there for the American people, why Hillary Clinton is clearly the best candidate as opposed to Donald Trump. What do you think Donald Trump's popular vote floor is? Floor. Mm -hmm. Low 40s. Low 40s. Low 40s. I mean, he's been in a lot of polls pre-convention, low 40s, didn't see him a lot of times, break 45. Can you name an issue in this race in which Hillary Clinton has basically defied the Democratic Party and said, we need to be more centrist on X? Um, well, if, the, if I had more time before we bring up, you know, Don I'll, and John, I'll give you as I could, long uh, as you I need. Probably. I'm, yeah, I've been thinking I'm all sure day I could about think it. of one. Um, I mean, throw one out at me. What I, orthodoxy is there that? I mean, there, there's, there's no question people on the left are talking about whether Hillary Clinton is a progressive or not. All right, so um, those are three big guests. Uh, we spent, we were busy this morning talking to these folks, all very important. What, like, of all the stuff we heard today, what stood, stood out most to you? Well, because Bill Clinton is speaking tonight, and, uh, you know, when he ran in 1992, he supported NAFTA, welfare reform, the death penalty, right to work all challenged the Democratic Party and said, we're too far to the left, we can't win. It is fascinating to me to hear Hillary Clinton, who's by most standards favored to win this race, has moved to the left on many issues, in part because of Bernie Sanders, in part because of where the Democratic Party is. And Joel Benenson could not name a single thing, and I can't name a single thing, where she is saying to the Democratic Party, we need to change. Donald Trump saying a lot of things to the Republican Party yes. like that. Yes. I mean, one of the things that we always talk about is that the candidates who win presidential elections usually, usually go to have to go to their base at some point and say, you're wrong on this issue or that issue. You have to defy the base to show political courage, not just to move to the center, but it, as this kind of sign of a, that, that's a sign of strength in a lot of ways. Um, Trump has done that a lot more than Clinton's done that so far. Um, wh whatever you think of his positions that, he, that, Cl that Hillary Clinton has, she has more or less moved over. It's also true, though, that the country is just, the country is in many respects, especially on a lot of these social issues, gay marriage, for example, drugs, for example. The country is now, the middle of the country is a little bit more progressive on some of those issues, and that's part of what's happened with the Democratic Party. But I do think it's created a very interesting ideological tangle between her and Trump. Because Trump is more to the left of her on some issues, he's more to the right of her on others, and she is more, much more the orthodox candidacy. Candidate, he is the much more unorthodox candidacy within his, within their respective parties. Down on the floor now, John Lewis, the congressman from Georgia, great civil rights leader, is seconding the nomination of Hillary Clinton as we continue along here for about an hour, listening to both uh, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders be nominated for their party's nomination, and then we'll have the roll call. Know. All right. Um, what I do know coming up next, that before that roll call, we'll have more from this historic day at the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia. But first, we'll have a word from our sponsors.
back to our skybox above the floor here at the Democratic Convention in Philadelphia, joined now by Democratic strategist, Philly native, Michael Feldman, who worked for Bill Clinton's 1992 presidential campaign and was a longtime advisor to Al Gore. Um, as you've watched the convention, do you think uh, so far the message that the American people have gotten is more of unity or a little bit of chaos and disunity? Um, well, what they've gotten, what most people have gotten from the programming convention is actually uh, it's a it's a it's a message of uh, competence. It's a message of uh, experience. It's tonight a testimonial to Secretary Clinton and everything that she brings uh, to the nomination. Um, but look, we're the Democratic Party, um, and we're always a little uh, chaotic. Very bunctious. Yes. Yeah. And um, you know, look, we've never been uh, very corporate about the way uh, we nominate our candidates. And I think what you saw uh, last night and what you've seen leading up to this point is a sort of natural part of the process. But here's, a, but here's a question about the media environment, something you're really familiar with, right? There's a conventional wisdom in past conventions that we've all been to for the last 20 years, which is, you know, there's like one speech every night that breaks through. And on that basis, you'd say Michelle Obama killed it last night. That's all really anybody was paying attention to. Maybe a little bit of Bernie Sanders, too. But in this world of social media that we now live in, where the stuff that happens at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, does that seep through now? Does, does the protest, the Sanders discord, does that rival Michelle Obama in the public conscience? or is it still overshadowed by primetime TV? Uh, look, it's a, it, it occupies our conversation, right? It's fodder. It raises interest. I bet it probably juiced the numbers a little bit last night. People were interested in what was going to happen in the hall based on everything that led up to that point. But I still think the programming of this convention, the speakers the, uh, lined up delivering messages that are thought through and intentional and sequence uh, is an effective way to communicate to people who aren't so interested in necessarily who's gaveling in the convention, but who's going to be the next president of the United States. I want to ask you about a topic we talked about last block. Um, I asked Joel Bennettson this afternoon to name an issue on which Hillary Clinton was challenging the Democratic Party orthodoxy and saying we need to be more centrist. He couldn't come up with one on the spot. Mm -hmm. I have been thinking about it for a couple days, can't come up with them. You've heard yesterday, you heard a lot of very liberal things, mm -hmm. things that you would not have heard at Al Gore's convention, I don't believe. Mm -hmm. Is that a problem for her? I, I don't think it's a problem for her. First of all, I think her first goal right now is to make sure that she has a unified Democratic Party uh, coming out of uh, this convention. This is shaping up to be a very important uh, turnout election. And uh, I think there are two things that will animate the Democratic Party. One is this process now of, uh, of uh, Secretary Clinton bringing in the various strands of the nominating electorate and energizing them around a platform that goes to what you're talking about here. There are a lot of issues, there's a lot of passion in the Democratic Party for some of those ideas that are represented in this platform. The second is the choice. And um, I don't think anything in the end is going to be more animating than the choice between Secretary Clinton and Donald Trump. And I think that's the phase of the election we're moving into. So the roll call is just beginning right now, mm -hmm. literally on the floor. How much does it matter that this now go off without a hitch and that it be executed in the kind of the way they hope it will be executed, flawlessly and ending with a picture of unity? Um, I, I don't think it matters that everything go according to script. Um, and it's far from that. I think we'll probably see some impromptu moments yeah. in this. And I think that's okay. I think a lot of what you saw yesterday was very cathartic and useful in getting people a chance to have their voices heard. And that's exactly what's going on right now uh, with this roll call vote. Um, everybody has their voice heard, and everybody will have a chance to, uh, to, to have their, their vote cast. But in the end, to your point, um, I do think people are going to leave here focused on a common mission and a goal. Can you think of anything in your career parallel to what's going on with the Clinton and Sanders supporters? Um, no, I mean, first of all, every primary, every contested primary, I should say, has some elements of that. Frankly, in uh, 2000, um, when Al Gore won every primary and caucus as a sitting vice president, but he had a, he had a feisty competition in Senator Bradley in the in the early uh, stages of the contest, and it took a long period of time, even through the Democratic convention, to bring a lot of those people back on. That's a process. This one may be backloaded a little bit. We may be going right up to the edge of the uh, of the nomination, but I don't think that's a bad thing. Okay, the roll call continues on the floor. We'll keep monitoring that. We'll bring some of it to you in a little bit. Mike Feldman is going to stay with us. We're going to have more from the floor and from here in the booth. So the roll call is officially underway, as we said. We'll be right back. Recognized tribes, Alaska, which makes the United States an Arctic nation, casts six votes for the next president.
President of the United States, Hillary Clinton, and 14... Country. I am proud to be joined here by Jerry Amit, age 102. <laughs> Madam Secretary, Arizona cast 34 votes for Senator Sanders. And 51 votes for the next president of the United States of America. in full swing, although still in an early phase. That was Arizona going at the Democratic Convention here in Philadelphia. Um, there are 50 states. Arizona is very early in the roll call. I think it's an A state, right? Alphabetically, a. Alphabetically speaking, they go that way. Um, we're still here with Mike Feldman, who was with us before, contributing brilliantly. And now we also have Guy Cecil, who's with us, who's the chief strategist and co-chair of the Pro Clinton Super PAC Priorities USA. Guy, good to see you. Thanks for having me. Um, I want to ask you, we want to talk to you a little bit about Bill Clinton. You both know Bill Clinton pretty well. You know him pretty well. Um, what are you expecting to hear from Bill Clinton tonight? We were asking before, is there any chance he's maybe a little rusty, or is he just going to be like Bill Clinton, huge as usual? I have a feeling he'll be Bill Clinton, huge as usual, but I think it'll be a lot different than 2012. Uh, I expect it'll be a much more personal speech. I think it'll be maybe a little bit lighter on policy and more about the woman that he's been married to um, and how he has seen her grow into the first woman nominee. And um, I think people are pretty excited. Longer about it. or shorter than 2012? 48 minutes in 2012. Shorter. Shorter. That's my over under. Shorter. Right. You? Depends when he starts. <laughs> In I the, can't wait. In the fundraising business, which is partly what you're in now, big part of what you're doing, uh, you do better when Donald Trump does better. So did the Trump convention in Cleveland uh, get your donors afraid that uh, he might win and they open up their checkbooks here? Yeah, look, I think overall it's definitely been, um, in part because we're just getting closer to the election, more people are paying attention because we're in the convention space. But certainly when you get out of a Republican convention, our donors uh, become much more motivated. And I think they're starting to understand what, frankly, we've been saying all along, which this is going to be a close election that this is not going to be an election that ends in May or June or July, that it's going to go all the way to November. And so we're definitely seeing more people coming out, not just Democrats, but frankly, Republicans uh, who just can't bring themselves to support Donald Trump. To go to the discussion we were having earlier, if you listen to the elite media, and I'd say even now the elite media, the Republican convention last week did not go well. Controversies, Melania Trump, various things that played out all through the week. And people were pretty down on it. And yet, 
Trump seems to be getting, be getting a lift out of the convention. So what does that say about how much conventions and all the stuff that the media is obsessed with? How much does that actually matter in the end? Well, it does matter. I, the way I look at it is um, Donald Trump has missed some opportunities. Last week was four successive nights of the stage to hit to themselves, essentially, and a chance to communicate in an unfettered way to the to, to electorate. Um, Michael, I'm going to stop you there. Let's go down the floor and listen to California Governor Jerry Brown, who's speaking for his delegation. You see behind him there, Kamala Harris is running for the Senate, also a big Hillary Clinton supporter. Okay, Michael, sorry, pick up right there. I'm just going to say that's an opportunity that I don't think they took full advantage of. There was plenty of interest in the speech. They got plenty of message out, although I'm not sure it's exactly a message that was programmed intentionally and strategic. Um, but they still had the stage for themselves. Um, but I, I've never paid too close attention to polls and to the electorate right around convention time. As you guys know better than I do, it's very volatile and it's hard to know. I think things will settle down in a week and we'll know where the race is. And to Guy's point, I, I don't think there's anybody that feels complacent about this election. It is going to feel close. It may break one way or the other, but it's going to feel close to the very end. And now we're at decision-making time where people have to understand the stakes uh, of the election. And so the conventions are a chance to present your vision. It's to draw contrast with your opponent. But then people go back, they absorb the information, and they start deciding who do we want to leave the country. DNC email controversy. We know some things about it, uh, but obviously it's an evolving story. What are what's something you don't know the answer to that you wonder about in terms of where the story's headed? Well, I suppose you always wonder if there are additional emails that will come out. What over are you time. hearing from people at the DNC? Nothing. Um, I don't talk to people at the DNC because I'm on the independent side, but. Um, I think the bulk of it is over, and I think the party handled it as well as they possibly could. And I see, you know, you see the changes happening in terms of how people are responding on what's happening on the floor, in terms of how Bernie delegates are responding to folks that are supporting Hillary on the floor. You know, we went from some frustrated Bernie supporters early in the night last night who we should have every expectation would have wanted to demonstrate on behalf of their candidate and frankly maybe even against their primary opponent. But as the night went on, as Michelle Obama gave her speech, you saw fewer and fewer people engaging uh, in that process. And I think that we'll see that for the rest of the, the convention. But I, I don't anticipate that um, what happened in an internal email at the Democratic National Committee is going to have any different uh, impact on how voters view the election between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Do you think that the that the, the, the speeches, obviously huge speeches, uh, Michelle Obama's speech was huge last night, Bill Clinton's we talked about, Barack Obama's tomorrow night, just relatively speaking, it, who do you think is going to have a more important speech, the Bill Clinton speech tonight, given the kind of testimony he's going to offer by his wife, or the Barack Obama speech tomorrow night from the sitting president? Yeah. Well, I obviously think they're both important, but I do think the, the testimony of Barack Obama, who's been in the office for eight years, who, especially younger voters below the age of 35 that weren't here during the Clinton administration in the 90s, to have somebody that they voted for, that they supported uh, so actively endorse and support Hillary, I think will be really important to continuing to bring the party together and to continue to increase uh, the level of interest on the part of millennial voters. So just from that perspective, I think the president could play an outsized role in how we come out of this convention. All right. Uh, Guy Cecil, Mike Feldman, thank you both for stopping by. It's always a pleasure to see you both. You're brilliant. We'll keep you posted on everything out there in TV land that the convention floor has to offer down there behind us. When we come back, Pennsylvania Senator Bob Casey will be in around this table. And if you're watching us in Washington, D.C., you can also listen to us on the radio radio at Bloomberg 99.1 FM. We'll be right back.
Max Guest uses convention speech here last night to welcome thousands of Democratic delegates to his home state. Tonight, we're welcoming to our Skybox set Senator Bob Casey of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, our host, or one of our hosts for the week. Senator, thanks for joining us. Great to be with you guys. Thanks. Put, if I put you in a room with 12 Sanders supporters, not diehard Never Hillary's, but ones who are still unhappy, and you were going to make the case to them, what would you say? I think it'd be mostly about uh, an economic case, uh, a focus on the middle class. I and mean, one thing Hillary said at the beginning of the campaign, and actually put it right on her website, she said the defining, and I'm paraphrasing somewhat, defining economic challenges, raising incomes for hardworking Americans. I think that's a, a place of a lot of unity, and I think it was a focus both of Hillary's campaign and Bernie's as well. So it'd be mostly about it, an economic message. The, the two separate questions by the end, by the time we get to the end of this roll call, um, will we have actual unity or will we have the perception of unity? Well, I think we'll have, a, we'll, we'll be well on the way to unity, but I think there's going to be some work after this. Yeah. Um, I don't think unity occurs at a magic moment in a, in a convention. It'll take some work. And my sense of this, I don't have data to back it up, my sense of this is we're going to have to spend more time this summer focusing on younger voters, for example, as one group. But uh, I think we'll get there. A lot of that is just drawing the contrast, which is, I think, plainly evident between the two candidates. We just saw moments ago uh, Senator Sanders' brother, who lives in overseas, cast his vote. Democrats have on board for his brother, uh, Bernie Sanders. The DNC, uh, evidence now released pretty clearly that people at the DNC supported Hillary Clinton, favored her in the process. In real time, we saw Senator Sanders, Martin O'Malley asking for more debates, Hillary Clinton asking for fewer, she got her way. At this point, do you feel comfortable saying that, in fact, the DNC favored Hillary Clinton during the nomination process? Well, I don't know enough about the, the, the content of the emails, but there's no question that uh, there has to be accountability when you have that, those kinds of infractions or, or potential violations. But what we have to do now is focus on winning the general so you, election. So you don't know enough to say that the Democratic Party favored Hillary Clinton? I, just, I mean, I haven't read enough, but it, the reporting seems to indicate that, but I, I haven't read Does enough. that outrage you, that the, your, your party would favor one candidate over, over others? Well, it, it, it will outrage me if there's not accountability. Uh, but I think there's there's time to impose that kind of accountability. What kind of things would you look like look for to say that's oh, I enough? I don't know. That's, I mean, that's up to the... I'm not a, a DNC mechanic. That's not my job. What I've got to do now is make sure that we go out and work hard to win Pennsylvania. What do you? Uh, what, what do and you? She will, by the way. Yeah, you think? I think she well, will. let's talk about that. There's just been there's been some you know, that that state is. You guys have had polling from your state that's shown uh, a, a very very close race, and polling that's shown that she's actually ahead by a healthy amount. What, what, why why are you as confident about Pennsylvania as you are? Well, because because of who the candidate is and who the candidate is on the other side. Uh, our state is always relatively close. The last time the president won it by five, um, so I would expect it to be close. But I think she'll win mostly because when I think undecided voters get to that basic choice, not just between the candidates, but I think the two overriding issues, economic security and national security, I think Hillary would do quite well. But it's going to be it's going to be a battle. We've got to get ready. In the end, do you think Donald Trump will do better in Pennsylvania than Mitt Romney did? Slightly, but, but not why? enough to win. Because why? Wait, why is he more appealing to your well, voters than it, it Mitt may Romney be, was? It may be because of his um, his focus on the trade issue uh, is one reason. And we still have to make sure that, that people know that there is a basic difference. I mean, you're talking about a candidate in terms of Trump who has no economic plan that I can that I can point to that, that focuses on the, the fundamentals of what the middle class has been concerned about. And this uh, idea that, that I think has been very elusive for both parties is how do you put together a strategy to raise wages? You know, the EPI uh, Economic Policy Institute study showing that after World War II, wages went up until the early 70s by 92 percent, 9 percent for the next 40 years. We're at the end of that 40 years. We have a challenge that we've got to meet. You're a pretty good friend of President Obama's. You've played a crime on a basketball with him at various times. Have you talked to him at all about how he's thinking about the speech he's going to give tomorrow night? I have not. I have not. It's been been a while since we've talked. The last time we talked um, earlier in the year was mostly about national security and uh, uh, those kinds of issues. But uh, I think he'll he'll figure it out. But I will say this: he's got a, a high bar to meet after 
the first lady's speech last well, night. Well, that's certainly true. But just talk about how, what you think the different things are that President Clinton and President Obama have to do for Hillary Clinton. What like what are their what's the brief for each of them in their high-profile speeches these next two nights? Well, I think for for President Clinton, um, I hope, and I don't know this, but I hope that he would give a speech that's similar to what he gave on the road in Pennsylvania, which in the primary, which was a validation of uh, her not just her service, but how she improved people's lives from the time she was a, a young advocate all the way to Secretary of State. For President Obama, I think it would be similar, maybe um, maybe more of an emphasis on her time as Secretary of State. Senator, I need to ask you to hold there for a moment. We're going to go down to the floor. Congressman Lewis is speaking on behalf of Hillary Clinton. Thank you so much. Georgia, you have cast 87 votes for oh. Secretary Clinton and 29 votes for Senator Sanders. Thank you again. On to Guam. So the roll call continues. We'll keep watching it as we go through the program. Senator Casey, thank you for joining us, and thank, thank you again for hosting us. Good to be with you. Great to be here in the Commonwealth. Coming up next, more from the Democratic Convention, more on the roll call from Philadelphia right after this. Today, from the island of Guam, a remarkably diverse community and the homeland of the Chamorro people, we have traveled over 8,000 miles and through nine time zones to cast our only vote for the president and the vice president. We want a president who is sensitive. Joining us now are Kellyanne Conway, senior advisor to Donald Trump's campaign, and also liberal politics reporter covering the Clinton beats Jennifer Epstein. Ladies, lovely to see you with all this drama unfolding behind us. Um, Jennifer, what, in your view, on the basis of what the plans were for how this roll call was supposed to unfold, what do you think the Clinton people are thinking right now as they watch it so far? Please. I I think that they're pleased. I think that they, they understood that, that considering how the Bernie Sanders movement has ha happened and rolled out, that they needed to let these people have their votes. And giving them this is 
maybe not the same sign of unity that Secretary Clinton showed in 08 and just by acclamation, you know, handing over all of her votes, but it's still, it's a way to get through this and not be too divisive, not hopefully not upset too many people too much on the Sanders side, uh, hopefully not upset too many Clinton supporters who are sort of frustrated and fed up with Sanders and his supporters continuing to be around. And then, you know, they, when, when we get to the very end of the alphabet and then we skip Vermont and go back to Vermont at the very end, it'll be over and it'll be way less drama filled than some people worried it would be. In the first two days here, do you have Democrats done anything you think of creating political problems for themselves? I do. Uh, maybe if you're measuring this on the bar of how bad things were two days ago with the WikiLeaks and Deborah Wasserman Schultz's resignation, then it looks better for Clinton. But if you're measuring on what she might have expected and should have expected, having been the presumptive nominee for the eight years, basically, since she lost the first time, this cannot be the convention that she expected to walk into where, Mark, they're literally cutting off the audio from the stage at some points to, to mute the boos. Um, and if you go outside the convention, where I've been an awful lot, and you talk to people, uh, whether they're peaceful protesters or really hepped up about, you know, they're so angry at what's going on, you see a lot of Jill Stein supporters, Gary Johnson, and certainly Bernie Sanders, who refuse to capitulate to who they see as the corporatist pro-Wall Street Hillary insider Hillary Clinton. I don't think the facts that were revealed this weekend helped that very much. Uh, so we'll see. She'll make the case on Thursday. I think if two-thirds of the country don't trust you and don't think you're honest, I would like to know what it is she can say this week or even this year that will convince those people that, well, she may be a liar, but she's our liar, so I'll just look past that. We just don't see that yet. Um, what's the answer to that question? What, what do you think the, the Clinton campaign hoped, how do they hope to solve the problem, the political the, problem that Kellyanne just talked about? The trust problem is, you know, probably their biggest challenge and has been their biggest challenge all along. She started to acknowledge it in a couple of speeches that she's given in the last month or so, a speech in Chicago uh, to Jesse Jackson's group. And they think that they just need to kind of see her, com her you know, speeches and her interviews and also bring out people like President Obama. I mean, they think they really think that the idea that Bar Barack Obama, who now has a f approval rating above 50 percent, is out there saying, I trust this woman that that should go a long way. I'm not sure it does necessarily. I think that there's still a disconnect. I think the fact that he ended up endorsing her, uh, you know, the same day as James Comey, uh, it's just it at the same yeah. press conference. So I don't know that it's it's really been the message that they've gotten through. I think this is like the constant struggle with them is, you know, everybody says you don't, and the, the theme of tonight is sort of like getting to know Hillary Clinton, like this woman who's been in the public eye for almost 30 years and yet we still don't know her. Um, and, you know, her people want to make that clear to us that we, America doesn't know Hillary Clinton and America needs to get to know the real Hillary Clinton. And that's the woman who, you know, did legal aid and, and you know, education programs. And we still don't know that. Jen, the risk of constantly, and I heard it even yesterday, Hillary Clinton has been fighting for women and children for 20, 30 years. Where are the results? It's a serious question. She may have been out there fighting in the trenches, but then you have people saying, we can't have people living in poverty. We can't have million pe millions of people living in poverty. We can't have opiate use destroying the lives of kids in the suburbs. We heard that last night. We can't have all these millions of people still not covered by health service. That sounds like an anti-incumbent argument. All the people from the podium are making the case that we make at the Trump-Pence campaign, which is this is at its very core a change election. This is basically what Barack Obama did successfully in 2008, George W. in 2000, Bill Clinton in 1992. You've had two terms, in the case of 92, three terms. Don't you want something different? I feel like every time they plead their case about what's wrong with America, it cuts against the Obama-Clinton message of give us four more. Many of the Democrats here have criticized your convention for saying there wasn't enough policy, there weren't enough specific ideas. Our understanding is there are going to be a series of policy speeches coming up That's this right. month and next. What kind of topics do you expect those speeches to be about? Some of the topics that Mr. Trump and Governor Pence have covered already. So veterans and soldiers, certainly um, law and order. Uh, Ivanka Trump last week talked about making child care accessible and affordable to all who need it. Uh, you'll see plans like that. What, what does the world look like in a Trump presidency post-Obamacare? Uh, coming on basically the seventh anniversary of the Affordable Care Act having been passed when he's inaugurated. 
So you hear that economic and tax policies they've been working very all these hard on between that. now and Labor Day. Now all these between the court in the course of the campaign, and I do take objection for those who said, well, apparently the voters take objection because we got great reviews in the CNN polling and elsewhere for the convention. But I, there were specific policy speeches, and I, I think these convention speeches are a little bit like State of the Union speeches, whereas you, you give the list of priorities and your vision and your values, and and you don't necessarily sit there with your actuarial data and fill in. So in fairness, I think we heard plenty of concrete ideas. Look at something you did today, and look at something the VA 10-point plan to reform the Veterans Administration. That's specific. Let me ask you just real quick. Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, the Clinton campaign obviously thinks they are huge assets over the next two nights. Is there any concern that Hillary Clinton, given her oratorical abilities, will be overshadowed by her husband and her president? Yeah, I think there certainly is an acknowledgement that, that both of them, as she always says, are the natural politicians, and she's not, and she's not the same kind of magical speaker. But I think that what they're hoping is that just the fact that she's going to hit this, like, kind of momentous occasion and, like, you know, be the first female nominee, uh, you know, and kind of give maybe the same kind of speech that she gave in Brooklyn about a month ago, that that's enough. All right. Jennifer Epstein, Kellyanne Conway, thank you. We'll be right back with more of this roll call after this. Kentucky, we know the beauty of bluegrass, rolling hills, and the... The roll call Mountain. rolls along here at the Wells Fargo Arena, where Democrats, Democrat delegates are expected to make Hillary Clinton the first woman ever elected as the presidential nominee of a major political party. Check out all of our team's convention coverage here from Philadelphia at BloombergPolitics.com. Coming up on TV and Bloomberg West, for both of us, thanks for watching. Sayonara.
I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg West. Let's begin with a check of your first word news. At the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia, the roll call of states to formally place Hillary Clinton's nomination, her name and nomination. Run as deep as our forests, we are loggers and lobstermen, farmers and fishermen, home of Acadia, Longfellow, L.L. Bean, and Stephen King. May Maine has not voted for a Republican in nearly three decades. As Maine goes, so goes the nation, and so goes the nation for a Democratic president. Maine cast 18 votes for Senator Bernie Sanders. and 12 votes for Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton. Thank you very much, Maine. You have cast 12 votes for Secretary Clinton, 18 votes for Senator Sanders. Again, thank you. Maryland, my Maryland! You have 120 votes. How do you cast your vote? <laughs> Madam Chair Lady, the great state of Maryland, the birthplace of the great Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, Francis Scott Key, and the author of our nation's Star Spangled Banner, the home of the United States Naval Academy, the home of the Chesapeake Bay, the largest estuary in the United States and the third largest in the world, the home of the great, great Senator Barbara Mikulski. who in 1986 became the first woman elected to the United States Senate from Maryland and the first Marylander and woman to chair